Welcome everyone, my name's Sylph, and this is my attempt to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Black 2 with only Ice-type Pokemon. The full rule set for this run is listed down below, but put simply, only the first Ice-type encounter in each route or area can be caught. If a Pokemon faints, it must be permanently boxed. No items except health items in battle. Party Pokemon levels are limited to the next gym leader or the final league member's ace. And finally, the battle mode must be put on set at all times. This is the very first time we're using the Ice type for a hardcore Nuzlocke, and I figured what better time than now to celebrate the holiday season. But there's good reason we've never done one before. Ice types are incredibly difficult to find in the main series games, usually being found around the seventh badge or so, such as the Ice Cave, Seafoam Islands, etc. It's nearly impossible to actually do a hardcore Nuzlocke with Ice types if you can't get them until then. But today, I think I've found a way to do an almost entirely legit run with them. I'm incredibly excited to finally be able to use them, and Black 2 actually has a decent variety of potential ice types to work with. But as you can imagine, the encounter methods themselves can be crazy to make this work. We do have three limitations, however. While we can get an Eevee in the Castelia Park, the Ice Rock that's required to evolve it is limited to the post-game. Cryogonal is also limited to the post-game in Twist Mountain, and finally, since we don't use legendaries, Kirom is of course a no-go. Now, losing a dragon is never fun, especially not one as cool as Kirum, but that's why we've got today's sponsor to help us out, Dragon City. Dragon City is a free-to-play game that you can download below where you collect hundreds of dragons of different elements and rarities to build your own dragon empire. If you guys like Pokemon, which, I mean, hey, you are on a Pokemon video after all, you'll love this game as the unique monster collecting and battling elements are epic. But building an empire and having such a wide variety of monsters brings it one step further. To unlock new levels and expand your city, you'll need to collect food, gold, and gems. Your dragons will come in handy for this, and you can even breed two dragons to get new ones, hatch them, and feed them to have them evolve. Training your dragons and taking them into battle makes them even more powerful, and then you can join the combat and arena where you can challenge your friends in battle and other dragon masters too. There are several really cool events every week and a brand new battle pass where you can unlock both new rewards and dragons daily. As if all that wasn't enough, you can also find the dragons of your favorite YouTubers with some amazing designs. Click the link in the description to get the game and you'll get a free special reward to get you started. 15,000 food, 30,000 gold, and the exclusive Scout Dragon. Thanks to Dragon City for sponsoring this video and let's get into the run. Black 2 and White 2, perhaps the single greatest Pokemon games of all time. I'm excited for this one. Before leaving the house, we say goodbye to our mom, and yes, mom, I know how to open my bag. Stop embarrassing me in front of all my viewers. Come on. For our starter, I decide to pick Tepig, which I nickname Evander. This is going to give Hugh, our rival, Oshawott, and although him having Tepig would seem like a better challenge, long term, I think Samurott will be a tougher opponent since we will have a few water and ice Pokemon after all. After Bianca gives us some Pokeballs and teaches us how to catch a Pokemon, God, what would we do without her? Our adventure officially begins. Ah, so amazing that the game lines up with our theme since it's winter time, and as much as I hate winter being from Canada where it's like minus 30 for half of the year, I do love the look of it aesthetically at least. Up ahead we encounter the former champion Alder who, depressed from his loss against N two years ago... No, Alder, don't do... At the Flossessi Ranch, we come upon one of the wonders of the Pokemon world, which somehow got approved by both the developers and publishers of this game. Alright, I'm gonna take 10 more seconds to enjoy the winter scenery because it has occurred to me that I haven't really played these games all that much in the winter. On our way back to Aspersia City, Alder revives himself and gives us some Oran Berries which can very much come in handy early game. Now at this point you're probably like, uh, Sylph, where the hell are you gonna get an Ice-type encounter? Well, for this encounter, we're going to make an ever-so-slight modification to the game. Normally, you get the sea gear just after the first gym, but I'm going to unlock it right now, like 15 minutes earlier than normal, which allows us to access something cool. You see, Gen 5 introduced a new area to the game called the Dream World, which was accessed through the Pokemon website, where you could catch a whole bunch of cool Pokemon through your Pokemon's dreams, which you can find using the Entra Link in the Entree Forest, kind of similar to the Pokewalker from Heart Gold and Soul Silver. 
The servers shut down in 2014, but I did play it back in the day, and the Pokémon within it were intended to be accessible during the main lifespan of the games. Without it, there are no Ice types until around the 6th badge, so what we're going to do is allow one Ice type from the Icy Cave Dream World area at the start, after the 2nd badge, and after the 4th badge, which are all available from the start of the game, thankfully. The first requires no points whatsoever, so it's an immediate catch, a Snover. We catch it from the forest successfully, and I nickname it Grinch. Grinch has a quirky nature, which is neutral. Now, one unfortunate thing is that Dream World Pokémon do get their hidden abilities, so we don't get the Snow Warning ability to start Hail, but hey, can't really complain given our limited encounters. With that, we deposit Evander the Tepig and head out on our journey. The Flossessi Ranch is perfect for us since while the Zuril, Mareep, and Psyduck give HP and special attack EVs, and I'm planning on making Grinch a bulky special attacker. After some grinding, it's time for the Aspersia City Gym. This is a normal type gym, and for an unevolved Pokémon, Snover's actually got some decent stats, so he fares well against the trainers. In no time, we arrive at the first gym leader, Charon, who can be very scary early game, but I have a good plan, I think. He leads with Patrat, and, well, what choice do we have? Get out there, Grinch! Knowing Charon tends to power up with Workup, I go for Icy Wind, which lowers Patrat's speed. He does indeed go for Workup, and could have hurt us badly, but with the speed drop, we can now just attack again to take him down. His second and last Pokémon is a Lillipup, and as much as I want to put it to sleep with Grass Whistle, it's only 55% accuracy, so I try the same strat, hoping we'll survive. Amazingly enough, he just went for Workup twice in a row, with the AI perhaps not thinking we could lower speed this early in the game, so we bring him down to a sliver. Sharon potions it, then we outspeed again, and get a crit to take him down. Amazing. That was sheer punishment for charging up so much. You love to see it. Normally, the first gym poses quite a challenge, but Grinch is a madman. Living up to his name, I guess. Bianca gives us the return TM afterward, which has 102 power at max friendship, but for some reason, I don't see us reaching that anytime soon with the Grinch. She also gives us the C gear, uh, a little late on that one, Bianca. Our journey then brings us to Verbank City, where we have to witness Roxy fighting with her dad. What a first impression. And I immediately make sure to buy some repels for a particular reason. The Verbank complex is packed with fire types, and with Snover's low speed, we could easily not escape from one and get KO'd by a 4 times super effective fire move. So, we've got to be careful. The complex does go off successfully though, and we arrive at the Verbank gym. Now, this is a poison type gym, meaning it's super effective against our only Pokémon, so I'm quite worried. Thankfully, the trainers themselves don't tend to use poison moves, so we make it to Gym Leader Roxy relatively unharmed. Her team is terrifying for us, but honestly, there's not much more we can do to prepare, so let's see how this goes. She leads with a coughing, and I know it has smog, but it's only 70% accuracy with a 40% chance to poison, so I went with an Orinberry instead of a Pecha, as I think we'll need the extra health. Icy Wind brings her below half, she then uses smog, it lands, but no poison. Whew. That would have made the next Pokémon dangerous, as Whirlipede's Venishock would do double damage if we're poisoned. After Coffin gets KO'd by another Icy Wind, the beastly Whirlipede comes out, outspeeds, and hits us hard with Venishock down to 22 HP, but our Orenberry brings us back above half. Icy Wind then does even less than I thought, but it might be about a third or so. We now outspeed, and it is indeed looking to be about a third that it's doing. We get hit by Venishock again and survive on just 8 HP. And now that we outspeed, we hit it once more, and it does indeed KO. Wow. I am very grateful that we did some special attack EV training, as without it, we might have just missed the KO. We did have Grass Whistle and Swagger, which might have saved us, but I'm glad we didn't have to test those odds. With our second badge in hand, we can officially unlock our second encounter. This time, after 5,000 points, the Dream World offers us none other than a Sneasel. A Pokémon I've never really used in a playthrough, so I'm excited. I name him Axel, and he has an impish nature, plus defense, and minus special attack, which actually works quite well for us. Amazingly, we did get Ice Punch on it, as the Dream World has a chance for some cool moves. We didn't get any on Snover, but this definitely makes up for it. Alright, you guys know I am not a huge fan of Pokestar Studios, but this time I was like, okay, you know what, lots of people have been saying good things about it, I'll give it a chance, and actually pay attention to what's going on. But then... I realize this guy's name is Stu Dio. Alright, I hate this even more now. With Roxy's family drama now solved, her father decides to quit Pokestar Studios. You and me both, buddy. 
and continue his job as a sailor, bringing us to the massive Castelia City. Not only is this a wickedly impressive city for a handheld Nintendo console that was released in 2004, but it also contains numerous great items for us including a heart scale, the quick claw, the experience share, amulet coin, charcoal, the mystic water just north of it to boost water moves, and we can also lie to this girl by saying that our starter was a snivy so we can get the miracle seed for Grinch. Nice. With that, it's time to enter the sewers, an integral part of any grand adventure. Now here, I thought I was tripping out because the path that we have to take was completely different from what I remembered, but then I realized that it's because the water level is lower in the winter. Amazing attention to detail and great confirmation that I am in fact not on drugs. Down here we can grab the leftovers, after which I head north of Castelia to Route 4 so we can see some new Pokemon, thereby fulfilling the dex requirements to get none other than the Eviolite, which increases defenses of non-fully evolved Pokemon. Feeling much better about our odds now, it's time for the Castelia Gym. This gym is a bug type gym, and bugs are super effective against both of our Pokemon, even though they're not super effective against ice. Funny how that worked out. Even with the Eviolite attached, Grinch gets hit hard by a stupid Sawaddle, but ultimately we're able to make it through to the gym leader, Mr. Berg. Berg's team is ridiculous, with all super effective Pokemon on us, including a defensive Swadloon, a Dwebble with both types super effective against both of our Pokemon, and a speedy and powerful Levani. After coming up with a strategy, it's time to do battle. He leads with his Swadloon, and I send out Grinch. We miss our very first Icy Wind off the bat, a great start, then he lowers our speed with String Shot. He outspeeds and hits us with Struggle Bug, but with the Eviolite we tank it pretty well and start hitting it with Icy Wind to reverse the whole speed situation. After he Hyper Potions, we're able to hit it three more times for the KO as he just went for String Shot even though we missed another time. In comes Dwebble next, and we exchange Smackdowns and Icy Winds until he's at two-thirds and we get brought super low, at which point I wanted to activate my plan, but we missed Grass Whistle. Uh-oh. I have no choice now, I have to switch an Axle into an attack, and Smackdown hits us for a third before Ice Punch just barely doesn't KO. He then uses Rock Polish, and I'm like, oh no, he might outspeed us now, but I remembered that we had Priority Quick Attack, which gets the job done. His final Pokemon is Levani, and at this point it's very rare that you have a Pokemon that can outspeed it, but Axel does and hits it with Ice Punch. It barely survives, but we get the freeze. This then allows us to take it out on the next turn with another. We would have survived anything but a crit struggle bug anyway, and you know what? I don't feel bad after missing three attacks earlier. Third badge down. Let's go. Up ahead on Route 4, we have a battle that I almost forgot about, Colrus, a Steel-type trainer, again super effective against us. I decide to teach Axel Rock Smash, as I think that's our only hope. He leads with Magnemite as I send out Axel, and Rock Smash does a good amount of damage, but he hits a Thunder Wave. Oh no. He now outspeeds us and hits us with Magnet Bomb, but it doesn't do too much, and we make it through for the KO. His second and final Pokémon is a Clink that has Gear Grind, so I'm very nervous. He starts using Charge though, but we stay paralyzed for two turns in a row before hitting him for less than half on the third. He uses Charge again before I hit him once more, but he barely survives on a sliver, uses a Super Potion, and then we stay paralyzed. The Gear Grind finally comes through and hits us to just 16 HP. Oh god. Thankfully, we do land a hit afterward though. I have no choice, so I'm forced to switch into Grinch, Gear Grind hits us to just 9 HP in the red, but thankfully we outspeed and hit a Grass Whistle to put him to sleep, after which two Razor Leafs do the job as he stays asleep. Man oh man, that was close. Thank god for the Eviolite. On this route, we can pick up some crucial items including Citrus Berries from this guy and the Dig TM buried in the sand. In no time, we arrive at Join Avenue and they kept asking me questions, so... Whoops! I picked two separate phrases after they warned me that everyone would see what I put online, and it looks like they got joined together. Too good. He then says, I knew it! You're the one! Who else could be so well suited to managing the avenue? <laughs> With that hilarity behind us, we arrive in Nimbasa City, the Pokemon version of Vegas. Here, we unlock the Battle Subway, and there are a ton of really great items you can get here, including the Razor Claw to evolve Sneasel. However, we need three Pokémon to enter, and there's a good chance we could lose a Pokémon. Not to mention, it's not nighttime anyway, and there is one that we can get later on, so I'm gonna pass for now. Although they're expensive, the Pokémon Center here also has some great TMs like Reflect and Light Screen, so we'll have to remember that for later. 
Alright, I'm gonna be honest, this is hands down one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen. Not to mention this demented Audino is celebrating the arrival of his overlord. Going through some Disneyland nonsense grants us access to the Nimbasa Gym, an Electric-type gym. Finally, we have some leeway as Grinch resists the Electric-type, and even if we do get paralyzed, we do have priority Ice Shard to finish opponents off. Great stuff. The fourth gym leader is Elisa, and I taught Axel the Dig TM before challenging her, hoping it might be an answer as her Zebstrika does have Flame Charge, which is dangerous. She leaves with an Emolga, and I send out Axel. I go for Hone Claws right away to raise our attack, and then we get hit with a Volt Switch, which brings in Zebstrika. Thankfully, we do outspeed it, so I can go for a Super Powered Dig for the instant KO. Amazing. With our raised attack, her Flaffy gets wrecked by another dig, but it did paralyze us with its static ability. Just to be safe, I switch into Grinch to take the next Volt Switch, then an Icy Wind followed by a couple Ice Shards after she heals do the job, even though she outprioritized our priority move with Quick Attack. Seems legit. After the battle, one of the models says, Beauty isn't just about looks. Strength is a part of beauty, both for you and Elisa. Are you implying that I'm ugly? Oh god, I am! Look at me! With the fourth badge in hand, it's time for our last trip to the Dream World to pick up a Pokémon that requires 7,500 points, a Snowrunt. Our catch ends up being a female, which I'm actually really happy about, and I nickname her Martha. Martha has a mild nature, plus attack, and minus special defense, which is kind of bad, but it does have Water Pulse, which is pretty cool. I put the XP share on her and head toward Driftvale. On the way, we encounter a local tourist attraction, Heartbreaker Charles. We decline his offer and he says, Oh man, getting someone's attention is really hard. Oh yeah, 20 people swooning around you. Re real tough, Charles. Ah, he's so dreamy. Unrequited love or not, we arrive in Driftvale City, the location of the next gym. Here, we can pick up the Expert Belt in the market for 30% extra power on super effective moves. Not only has this city expanded since Black and White, but in the former Team Plasma House, you can actually find Anthea and Concordia, who took care of N when he was younger. Pretty cool in my opinion. Enough fanboying over the lore though, it's time for the Driftvale Gym. As a ground-type gym, we have super effectiveness here, so the trainers are quite easy overall. However, I don't think the same will be true of the gym leader, Clay, who has a part steel type in Excadrill. I theorycrafted for a while for this one and came up with a very weird strategy that I think might be our only hope. He leads with a croc rock and I send out Martha so Intimidate doesn't do much on us. Now here's the key. Martha has the Moody ability which means each turn one of her stats increases and one decreases. It's a risk but I think it's our only shot. I use Protect on the first turn to activate it immediately and we get plus special defense and minus speed. Literally the worst we could have gotten. Oh god. I go for Icy Wind, which does over half and lowers his speed, and then we get plus defense and minus accuracy. Not bad. Another Protect gives us plus accuracy and minus evasiveness, and then he outspeeds again to hit us to 34 HP with Crunch before Icy Wind does the job, and then we get plus accuracy and minus speed. Alright, this did not work out at all. Just brutal. Excadrill comes in, I use Protect again, and we get plus special defense and minus accuracy. Why? Just why? Knowing my plan has failed, I decide to stay in and sack Martha. But she survives a rock slide on just 2 HP and hits a water pulse, but no confusion. How in the world? Not wanting to fumble the opportunity here, I switch into Axel, hoping he'd go for Rock Slide again, but he goes for Stab Super Effective Metal Claw, but we survive on just 9 HP. Oh my god, I thought that was the end. From here, we can outspeed and hit him with super effective Expert Belt Boosted Dig for the KO thanks to the damage from Martha. Unreal. His final Pokemon is Sandslash, which has high defense and I know we can't KO, so I switch into Grinch. He hits us with Bulldoze, which doesn't do much, but drops our speed. He then hits Crush Claw though, which drops our defense and I think we die to one more. I hit him with Icy Wind, which brings him below half and drops his speed, but... I think he still outspeeds too. I have no choice though, so I have to sack Grinch. But he survives on just 2 HP despite the defense drop. Oh man! A final attack then does the job to win us our fifth badge. I don't think we've ever had a battle that close in terms of all of our Pokemon being brought below 9 HP. That could have ended our run easily, but our strategies just barely pulled through.
After taking on the Pokemon World Tournament and having to face Colrus again, thankfully we had Dig this time, although that certainly won't save us in the future, we get the Surf HM from Charon and later arrive at Chargestone Cave. Now I kid you not, I spent two hours here desperately searching the dust spots for a Dawnstone, and it was the 39th item that I found, not including all the times that we encountered a Drill Burr, so probably like 80 dust spots found. But hopefully it'll be worth it as we can now evolve Martha into a beautiful Frost Lass, giving us some ghost type coverage too. Mr. Alton City is now upon us, but our real point of interest is just up north on Route 7 where we can finally, finally catch a non-Dream World Ice Encounter, a Cub Chew, which is a 25% chance to find here only in the winter time. We catch one and nickname it Ozzy, and Ozzy ends up having a Jolly Nature, plus speed and minus special attack, which is pretty much perfect. After training him up a bit, we head to the Mistralton City Gym, conveniently located on the tarmac of an airport. As a flying gym, you can imagine our ice types tear through all the trainers with relative ease, although I quickly learned not to overestimate Grinch here. Along the way, Ozzy evolves just before the level cap into a beastly bear tick, who also learns Icicle Crash too. It's time for the sixth gym leader, Skyla, and unfortunately only in these games, not in the original black and white, she has a Skarmory, which actually makes this battle trouble for us. I come up with a plan and go for it nonetheless. Her lead is a Swoobat, so I send out Martha, primarily so that she can't use Attract on us. Icy Wind brings her to just a quarter, and then she hits us with Acrobatics for about a third. Here, I preemptively switch into Ozzy, and she hits us with Assurance and gets hurt by a Rocky Helmet that we got near the Pokemon World Tournament. She does heal Swoobat up, but then Icicle Crash is a one-hit KO. In comes Skarmory next, the bane of our existence, and it immediately hits us with Steel Wing. Here's the key though. I use Charm to lower its attack, and we should survive another now, so I stay in, we survive on 27 HP, and with the Rocky Helmet damage, we're able to bring her to about a quarter with Icicle Crash. Unfortunately, I don't want to risk a high roll KO, so I switch into Martha, and Icy Wind just barely doesn't KO on like 1 HP, and I'm like, oh god. But we survive Steel Wing on just 10 HP before another KOs. We're not out of the woods yet though, as her Swana is neutral against Ice and is quite powerful. I have to switch, so I send in Axel, our only choice left. Bubble Beam does about a quarter, and I decide to use Home Claws to power up in case we can get a 2 hit KO here. Air Slash brings us below half. Ice Punch brings her below half, but her Citrus Berry activates before we get brought to just 18 HP. The range here is exceptionally close as we brought her to a third before her berry and now she has two thirds left, but I have no other choice. I go for Ice Punch and it looks like it just barely does the job from there to win us the badge. Man oh man, hard to believe a flying trainer did that much damage to an ice team. Lentimus Town is our next destination, which I always thought was a weird place. No gym, no places of interest, just a midway point on our journey to the other side of the map. We can get the spell tag here though to power up ghost moves, and after handing it to us, this old lady's like, Oh, you have a spell tag? Where in the world did you find it? Uh, lady, are, are you okay? Before anything, something occurs to me, so I fly back to Aspersia where we can now use Surf to grab the Energy Ball TM, a perfect move for Grinch who has been working with Razor Leaf this whole time. Back in Lentimus, we can also grab the Shadow Ball TM for Frost Lass, and then I'm like, damn, there sure are a lot of ghost associations here. And then... What the f***? After that traumatic experience, we get some good news as Grinch finally evolves into an Obama Snow which should add some good bulk to an otherwise frail team that we've been working with. We pass through the perilous Reversal Mountain and arrive in Undela Town, and I must say a tropical location is much better than what we've been seeing so far. Here we have a rival battle with Hugh, who we haven't seen in a little while. He leads with Unpheasant, so I send out Axel, and Ice Punch just barely doesn't KO surprisingly, but he just heals so we can tag it with two more for the KO. Next comes his Samurott, but we can't underestimate it. It has Reversal, which is super effective against our whole team and can do ridiculous damage. I switch in Grinch here, and we get hit for a quarter. Energy Ball just barely doesn't KO, but thankfully he had tried Encore first, so we can outspeed on the next turn to KO. I think that might have been a speed tie, to be honest. His Simi Sage is then walled quite hard as an Icy Wind, followed by Priority Ice Shard does the job, much to the delight of millions of Simi haters worldwide. Once the battle's done, I realize our next encounter is actually found just over here beside Undela Town in what's called Undela Bay. A Sphiel, which again only shows up in the winter. 
I catch one and nickname it Bricklebomb, couldn't spell it properly as it wouldn't fit, and he has a naive nature plus speed and minus special defense. We caught it in a dive ball too, which makes me quite happy. It also has the thick fat ability for extra resistance against fire types, which until now we haven't really had an answer for defensively. Speaking of fire, I accidentally got thrown into a triple battle that I wasn't expecting and... Flareon used Lava Plume, which hits all three of our Pokémon and would have been fine, except it got a critical hit on Ozzy, immediately taking him down. Ouch. Our first loss, and it was quite an unfortunate one, too. In Lacunosa Town, there's not much to do except admire the awesome architecture, but we can also pick up the Metronome item, which increases the power of moves used consecutively by 20% each time. Right next door is the Village Bridge, and underneath it we have a very special encounter. However, it's incredibly rare and took forever to find, as it's only found in rippling water spots, and it's only a 5% chance to find within them. Eventually, we do find it though, a Lapras. I catch it and nickname her Donna, and Donna ends up having a brave nature, plus attack, and minus speed, which is pretty terrible, but still a great Pokémon overall. On Route 11, we encounter none other than the ultra-rare legendary Pokémon Virizion, and... Sorry, I, I just don't care right now, I gotta go- Oh, hey, an item. Just gonna, um, <clears throat> just gonna grab that. There we go, okay, oh, okay, just a full heal. Hmm, well, oh well, I'll, I'll just be, I'll be going now, see, okay, see you, bye, I love you. Opelucid City is upon us, the location of the next gym, and a very cool place, to be honest. Before we head in, I grind up a bit, during which Bricklebomb evolves into a Celio, ever increasing his thickness. The Opelucid City gym is a Dragon-type gym, meaning we find ourselves at a type advantage again, and Axel does not play around with them, smashing most of the trainers with Ice Punch. In the process, Bricklebomb evolves again, this time into a beastly Walrein, one of my favorite underrated Pokémon of all time, so I'm ecstatic about this. The seventh gym leader is Drayden, and as much as it would be nice to try and run through his team with Sneasel, I don't think we have enough attack power, especially since his Pokémon have high defense. Instead, I attach the Expert Belt to Lapras, who can not only dish out a lot of damage, but can also take hits too. Not only that, but his only chance of killing us was crits from his high critical hit ratio moves like Slash, but Donna has Shell Armor, meaning crits are impossible. I knew there was scary potential with Dragon Dance on his Haxorus too, but looking at his coverage, the most he could have really done is Assurance, since Dragon Tail is negative priority, so Lapras is an amazing counter here. Seven badges. Opelucid City then gets invaded and has Ice shot at it, and Drayden's all like, Haxorus, obliterate the f out of everything in sight. <laughs> Zinzolin is our next major challenge, and I was quite scared for his bulky Cryogonals and Weavile, but Lapras is again perfect here with its bulk. I set up Rain Dance to boost the power of Surf, and then can Surf everything into Oblivion, even though it was a lengthy process. Shell Armor came in clutch here again, as all three of his Pokémon have high crit ratio moves, which were his only shot at beating us aside from some extra confusion luck. Let's go. The Shadow Triad are scary threats for us with Steel types, but I leveled up quite substantially for them and put the Eviolite on Axel, so a Home Claws followed by Dig takes down his Ponyards, and then his Absol could have been a big threat with Swords Dance and seems to have outsped us, but Home Claws saved the day as Ice Punch was a one hit KO. On to one of the cooler parts of the game, the Marine Tube, just a beautiful display of the DS's capabilities. At the end, this guy says, This place is like a walkthrough aquarium, but isn't this a place for Pokemon to see us? I... what? I... Existential crisis activated. Our tropical dreams come back to us in Humalau City, the location of the 8th and final gym. Now, one would think that Grinch would sweep through here, but there are actually a lot of flying types like Pelipper and Mantine, so I use Walrein instead with the Silk Scarf attached so we can tank anything they throw at us, set up Hail for extra damage, and body slam the hell out of everything until they all die. What a violent walrus. The 8th gym leader is Marlin, the water trainer, and here's a time for Grinch to shine, who I put the expert belt on. He leads with Caracosta, and I know this thing tends to shell smash, which could absolutely obliterate us with super effective stabs smackdown and its sturdy ability. So I devise a clever strategy. I'm gonna break his sturdy with Icy Wind, which also lowers his speed so that when he shell smashes, we can still outspeed and... Oh, he just went for smackdown right away. Alrighty then. Well, it would have been a cool strat at least. One energy ball obliterates him as we're brought a bit above half. 
Next up is Waylord, who's a bit scary with bounce, and Energy Ball just barely doesn't KO, but we got the special defense drop, and then he used Amnesia to raise his special defense, meaning it's now neutral, but after he heals, two more do the job. His final Pokemon is Jellison, and we outspeed with Energy Ball, which brings it under half, but its berry activates. Ominous Wind brings us low, and I don't think we'll KO with another thanks to his berry, so I'm forced to switch. I send out Bricklebomb, but he goes for Recover. Yikes. I set up the hail for guaranteed damage, and we eventually start getting overwhelmed and can't do anything past his recovery, so I switch into Axel. Realizing Scald would actually be terrible for us, I switch into Martha, as dangerous as it might be, and Spell Tag Boosted Shadow Ball does about three quarters, and then he goes for Ominous Wind, which I was hoping we'd survive, and we do, so just one more does the job. A bit messy, but we manage for our eighth and final badge. What is with everyone jumping off ledges in this game? I mean, really? Hello, my name is Sylph. I am a future League challenger. <laughs> Our journey next brings us to Route 22, which has another winter exclusive 5% encounter for us, which ends up being a Delibird. What an overpowered Pokemon. I catch one and nickname her Luhu, and she has a gentle plus special defense and minus defense nature with the Hustle ability. Definitely not amazing. Next up is the Seaside Cave where the Toxic TM is, but also yet another encounter, a seal, probably one of the most forgotten Pokemon ever. I catch one and nickname it Max, and since we already have a full party and two water and ice types, we don't really need a future dugong right now, so I'm going to leave him in the PC for now. Moving on to the Plasma Frigate, we have a double battle with Hugh against Zinzolin, and our Rain Dance, Surf, and Shell Armor strategy kind of works even better now, not only hitting both opponents at the same time, but also powering up Hugh's Samurai too, who resists our Surf, of course. Shortly thereafter, we arrive at the Giant Chasm, an amazing place for us. Here, we can pick up the Ice Beam TM, which I can finally, finally teach to, like, most of our team, and we also pick up one final encounter, but it's a toss-up as to who it will be. Thankfully, it does end up being Piloswine, which was a bit more likely than the Vanillish line, which does now get cut off as an encounter possibility. I nickname him The Mayor, and he ends up having a bashful, neutral nature, and I decide to replace Delibird with him. What we can do here is fly to the Pokemon World Tournament Move Relearner, who can teach him Ancient Power, which means after we rare candy him to level 46 to learn Earthquake ahead of time, we can evolve him into a Colossal Mamoswine, which should be an incredible addition to the team. Up ahead, we also find the Razor Claw, and I took a break after this and came back briefly at night to finally evolve Sneasel with it into a Weavile, yet another powerful addition. After beating Zinzolin one last time with her Lapras strategy, he just won't learn, will he? The real challenges begin. Next, we have to face none other than Colrus, the insanely powerful Steel-type trainer. After planning out what we might be able to do, it's time to see if it works. Now right away we run into our first problem, his Eviolite Magneton, which has Sturdy. I lead with Mayor and hit him with Earthquake, which brings him to Sturdy, and then he hits us with Stab Super Effective Flash Cannon, and we live on just 26 HP with a special defense drop. Whew, my calcs were correct. From here he uses a full restore, but two more Earthquakes then do the job. In comes his Magnezone next, which also has Sturdy, so I have to switch. I go into Donna thinking he'll use Flash Cannon, and he does, and I know I need to break Sturdy, so I go for Surf, hoping our bulk is enough to survive Discharge, and it is as we live with just 10 HP before hitting him. From here, it's very risky, but I switch back into Mamoswine, and he did go for Discharge, which we're immune to, so we can now outspeed him with Earthquake. In comes Metang next, and Earthquake is an instant one-hit KO. That's some power. Behem comes out next, which I don't think will KO, so I switch into Axel, predicting Energy Ball, which he did go for, so I go for Ice Punch for over half, and we get the Freeze. Definitely not something we needed, since he only really has Energy Ball against us, but I'll take it as another KOs him. His final Pokemon is Clinklang, which has an Air Balloon, so we can't use ground moves on him. Gear Grind and Thunderbolt could really hurt all of our team, but I switch into Bricklebomb, and he went for Shift Gear. From here, I hit him with Surf after he just used Shift Gear again, and it does over half. I was gonna switch Mammoth Wine here, predicting Thunderbolt, but I was like, you know what, we're not weak to Gear Grind, which is the move that he's charged up, and we won't die to Thunderbolt, so let's just go for it. And thank god I didn't switch, as he goes for Gear Grind, which would have killed Mammoth Wine, and we survive it on 54 HP and can KO him with one more attack. Wow, what a battle. Team Plasma's not finished yet though, as we have the final battle with Getsis, which of course involves him trying to kill us and creating one of the most powerful Pokemon in existence. His team is immensely powerful, but I feel we have decent coverage against it for once, so let's give it a try. 
He leads with Cofagrigus, and I lead with Axel. We resist or are immune to all of his moves, so I taught Axel Shadow Claw and put the Expert Belt on him for massive damage, and then he hisses with Toxic, but another does the job. In comes Seismitoad next, so I switch in Grinch, who tanks Drain Punch with over half, but his Poison Touch ability poisons us. Are you kidding me? From here, he uses Sludge Wave, and I thought it might be over, but we survive on just 17 HP, and our Citrus Berry heals us, so we can take him out with Stab, 4 times super effective Energy Ball, and survive Poison thanks to the Berry. Wow. Electros comes out next, and I switch in Brickle Bomb, who gets hit for a quarter, then I use Ice Beam for over half before he just uses Acrobatics. Interesting. I was anticipating Thunderbolt, but I figure we're probably in range now, so I switch into Mayor, and he did use it so we can avoid the Flamethrower and smash him with Strength for the KO. From here, both his Toxicroak and Drapion are super effective one-shots with Earthquake with the Soft Sand item. His final Pokemon is Hydreigon, so I switch in Lapras, who I think can tank most of what he has, and he hits us with Dragon Rush, and we live it with just over half, then he uses Rock Slide, and I was like, please no flinch, please no flinch, and it doesn't, so we can smash him with Ice Beam for the win. Wow, no words, our team is just making me really proud right now. After passing through the treacherous Victory Road, our final rival battle is upon us. This one was relatively uneventful. I KO'd both Unfezen and Simisage with super effective Stab Ice Punch from Axel thanks to our wicked speed, and then he sent out Buffalant. Here, I switched in Brickle Bomb, who tanked Head Smash with just 45 HP, and then was able to bait the Wild Charge, which did work, so Mayor got a free switch and could KO him with Earthquake. Samurott was then a switch into Donna, and, well, I just used Perish Song to make him faint in three turns since he can't switch and just switched out until he died. Sorry, Hugh. I, I had to. Revenge is scar- Hey, hey, where you going, man? With that, it's time for the Pokemon League. I prepared as thoroughly as possible, doing things like using the Move Relearner to teach Weavile Night Slash, going through the Battle Subway tons to get Brick Break on him too, got the Relearner to teach Mamoswine Ice Fang as well, fulfilled all of our EVs, and gathered any remaining items and TMs, etc. It's time for the Elite Four. The first Elite Four member is Chantal, the Ghost Type Trainer. She leads with Kofagrigus, and I send out Axel. Knowing she has Will-O-Wisp, I actually taught the Taunt TM here so she can't burn us, and then Expert Belt boosted Night Slash brings her to the red. Energy Ball does get a crit and a special defense drop on us, yikes, before another couple of Night Slashes do the job after she heals. Golurk comes out next, so I use the slightly more powerful Ice Punch for the one-hit KO. Chandelure is then easily handled by Night Slash, however its Flame Body ability burns us, lowering our attack. This makes Driftblim a bit more of a problem, but when I switched into Mayor, she actually went for Thunderbolt of all things, so Ice Fang then smashed her into Oblivion. Yup, totally planned. Next up, I decide to take on Caitlyn, the Psychic-type Elite 4 member. She leads with Musharna, and I lead with Axel this time, mainly to get Taunt off so she can't yawn us. Axel is not great here though, as her Pokemon have moves like 4 times super effective Focus Blast, so I switch in Martha who gets hit by a Charge Beam, and Musharna gets the special Attack Raise. Great. That then takes us below half before we can KO her with Shadow Ball. Sigilyph comes in next though, who is a one hit with Ice Beam. Now come the scary ones with Gothitelle next. I switch in Axel again, anticipating a Psychic, and the prediction works. Night Slash then does three quarters before her berry, and another takes her out after she merely uses Thunderbolt. Her final Pokemon is Reuniclus, the one with Focus Blast, in which I know would survive Night Slash unless it was a crit, but I can't risk that. I switch into Donna, and Focus Blast misses. Thank God. I set up Rain Dance here, hoping for extra power since she has Magic Guard so Toxic won't work, and then Focus Blast hits and does well over half. I'm forced to switch, so I go into Brickle Bomb, who avoids a Focus Blast, and now boosted by the rain, Surf does over half, so another is able to take her down after we survive Focus Blast on just 60 HP. That was damn scary. Thank goodness for that 70% accuracy. Next up, I take on Grimsley, the Dark-type Elite 4 member. Weavile would be great here, but Scrafty would survive Brick Break and hit us with his own for 4 times damage, and Crocodile has Intimidate too. I lead with Mayor against his Lipard, and after Fake Out followed by a Night Slash, I decide to set up Reflect before we get hit to half and can take it out with Earthquake. Scrafty comes out next and gets hit below half with Earthquake, then strangely enough uses Rock Tomb, which lowers our speed and activates our berry, but we still outspeed and take him down. Crocodile with Intimidate comes out next, so I switch in Donna, who gets hit by Earthquake, but Reflect goes down. 
I still went for Rain Dance though, thinking ahead to buy Sharp, and another takes us below half before leftovers, but then we get hit down to just 39 HP before Surf takes him down. That did a bit more than expected. His final Pokemon is Bisharp, and I have to switch, so I switch in Axel, thinking he'd probably go for Night Slash and not Excisor. And he did, so 4 times super effective Brick Break is a 1 hit KO. Amazing. After some rare candies, the final Elite Four member is Marshall, the fighting type trainer, a type super effective against ours. I spent a lot of time theory crafting for this one, and nothing was really working in my head, such as Frostlass with the Expert Belt Psychic since they'd survive and have payback, or have sturdy, etc. But I decided to try something I had in mind. Marshall's bulk and power are crazy, but let's see. He leads with throw, and I send out Brickle Bomb. Surf does less than half, unfortunately, then he uses Rock Tomb. He now outspeeds, so Storm Throw brings us to just 56 HP before I set up Hail, and this is primarily to break Sturdy on his sock. Here I switch in Frostlass, anticipating a fighting move which does work, and I can take him down with Psychic after Hail damage. However, he sends out Conkelder next. This threw me off entirely. I was expecting Sock since it has Payback and Rock Slide. Oh no. In the end, I realize I have no choice and I just have to hope that Stone Edge either misses or we survive since it's a range, but not only does he hit it, but it also KOs immediately. Ouch. In comes Donna with Surf, which I was sure would KO, but it survives on what must be 1 HP and smashes us with Hammer Arm for the KO. This is a disaster. Here I send in Brickle Bomb, who has the Mystic Water and should have more damage output, and we do over half with Surf after he heals, so another KOs. In comes Mian Xiao next, a terrifying prospect for us with Wicked Speed and High Jump Kick, which can one-hit KO our entire team. I just have to hope that he misses, but he doesn't, and Brickle Bomb goes down. This is not good. I have no choice, so I send in Mayor next, and somehow we actually outspeed it and one-hit KO it with Earthquake. What in the world? My calcs told me we were definitely outsped, so I have no idea how that happened. Sock is his final Pokemon, Earthquake brings him to Sturdy, but then he just uses Payback, so another does the job. We had three brutal losses there, but onwards, I guess. It's time for the final battle, the champion, Iris, with just three Pokemon. I'm not feeling too hopeful, but I'll give it my best shot. She leads with Hydreigon, so I send out Axel, and oh dear lord. I forgot to replace Taunt with Home Claws again, which was my whole plan. Big. Giant. Yikes. It has Flamethrower though, so I have to go for it, and Expert Belt Ice Punch actually KOs. Alrighty then. In comes Dredagon, who suffers the exact same fate. Haxorus comes out next though, but I have no choice, so I go for it again, and it just barely doesn't KO, and he goes for Dragon Dance. Knowing she'll full restore, I hit her again, and no high roll luck as she's back into the red. Now she'll outspeed, so I switch into Grinch, who gets hit with super effective Dragon Dance boosted Excisor, but we survive on just 3 HP, and now on the next turn, I can use Priority Ice Shard for the KO. Unbelievable. Archeops comes out next though, so I just use Ice Shard and Grinch gets taken down by Acrobatics. Here, I send Axel back out so we can outspeed and take down Archeops with Ice Punch. Not too often you outspeed an Archeops. Agron comes out next, and I'm worried Brick Break won't quite KO, so I switch into Mamoswine, who tanks Double Edge, and then we can go for Stab, 4 times super effective, 100 power Earthquake for the KO. Her final Pokemon is Lapras, and I know I need damage on this thing, so I hit it with Earthquake before it KOs Mayor with Surf. But this then allows me to send out our final Pokemon yet again, Axel, for the Brick Break, Outspeed, and KO. Wow, I can't believe we just did that. We beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Black 2 with only Ice types and one Pokemon remaining. Ice types were incredibly fun to work with, lots of Pokemon you don't normally see. They definitely struggled defensively until we got some water types, but their power and type diversity offensively was impressive. I hope you guys had fun with the run, and if you did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button as it really does help a lot and grows our community. A huge thanks to my YouTube members and patrons who make these videos possible. If you'd like to support and get your name up here, the links are also down below. Don't forget to check out Dragon City using the link in the description below and grab your rewards. Thanks again to their team for making this video possible, and I'll see you soon, hopefully as a Dragon Master. If you enjoyed, drop a like down below to help the video out and leave a comment letting me know what kind of run we should do next and I'll see you guys for our next challenge video.